Hello and welcome to Minds Between Languages. This special episode is hosted by Nestor Singer from Universidad de Santiago de Chile. The episode features a roundtable discussion on publishing cognitive translation and interpreting research, which was held in Santiago de Chile on the 8th of September 2023 during the 4th International Conference on Translation, Interpreting and Cognition. The guests in this episode of Minds Between Languages are Stephanie Diaz Galas, Fabio Alves, and Moritz J. Schaefer. Stephanie Diaz Galas is Associate Professor at Pontificia Universidad Católica de Valparaiso in Chile. Fabio Alves is Full Professor at the Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais in Brazil. Moritz J. Schaefer is Senior Research Associate at Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz in Germany. I'm Mr. Singer, your host today, in the sort of talk show that we're having. And I'm joined today by Dr. Stephanie Diaz Galas. Uh, I'm also accompanied by uh, Dr. Fabio Alves and Dr. Uh, Moritz Schaffer. So, uh, this is some sort of, uh, this is an interesting discussion that we're going to have with our panelists. And um, the idea is to have some sort of like intimate conversation. This is like the living room of your house. So please feel free also to join and con- participate as well. If you have any doubts, questions, comments, please do raise your hand and join us in, in this discussion. So I want to start just to um, pass on the, the link to, to the panelists and uh, ask them whether they can describe a little bit of their experience in publishing in, in this field. Just briefly, and then we can move on to other potential questions or issues and challenges that we face as a community in those outputs. So, Steph, if I may. Uh, Well, thank you for the invitation to be part of this panel. Um, I have been publishing in the interpreting studies field. Uh, My first uh, paper was published in 2011. Um, I published uh, uh, well, my my research and then the results of, of other my dissertation and other research projects ever since. And my experience has been very good, I would say, um, in, in the sense that uh, I have been able to publish in specialized journals like interpreting um, um, across languages and cultures, perspectives and other journals that are uh, from our field, and one perhaps uh, a good experience of hearing um, the, the, the opportunity to get feedback from reviewers. I have had good experience of, with uh, very friendly reviewers uh, for my papers, and um, I would say that on the, on the downside is the, the time that it takes to uh, for the publisher process, and it means to send out a paper to a journal for publication, especially in interpreting studies, we, we don't have that many journals um, to send our manuscripts to. So, um, of course, this is something that affects all the, I would say, all the publishing uh, sector or the publishing field. I am personally a section editor for translation studies and bilingualism at the Signos Journal, which is a linguistics and applied linguistics journal uh, here based in, in my university. Uh, we are indexed in web of science and scopus. And I know also from that avenue that the time it takes to ever, if I got a paper and I am able to send it out for publishing, it takes a long time. Um, it all, uh, it also, in my experience, it's also uh, another challenge perhaps is the ability to find reviewers for, for the faith for them to review the manuscripts and get those reviews on time. So I, I, I would say that that is my, my experience and what I see as uh, challenges uh, most when we refer to opportunities later. <laughs> Good. So, uh, it's good afternoon, right? So, it's past 12 o'clock. So, good afternoon, everyone. And um, if I may, uh, Nestor, I would like to change uh, the approach slightly, rather than talking about my own 
record of publications or experience, I think perhaps we should just address the room in a different way, because the way I look at you, I would say that some of the audience, uh, some of you who the audience have a lot of experience with publishing, it would be kind of boring to hear someone say, I published this, I published that, so <laughs> rather not. And whereas for the younger uh, researchers or students who are here, it's a much more puzzling question rather than how do I get there? Right? So I think perhaps if we had a slightly different focus about uh, the, the idea of publication, starting with the big question for me, which is how relevant it is to follow the published or parish paradigm. Does it apply to all of us? Does it apply to us in our small community of CTIS, Cognitive Translation and Interpretive Studies? Does it apply to us in the very same way that it applies to astrophysicists? Or, you know, so how do we get our message across? So one of the things that um, really concerned me, and it doesn't come out of my experience as a researcher, but more out of my experience as a university administrator, I was a vice president for postgraduate education at my university and uh, finished the term last year. And one of the challenges that we had is trying to understand how impactful that was for the university on the whole. So um, when we think of um, different communities, um, discourse communities, so to speak, right? where are we and where do we want to get at? So in this uh, gathering, we've been talking about a lot the dialogue between the global south and the global north. Uh, for us in Latin America, who have Spanish or Portuguese as a first language, publishing in English, uh, not in English as a lingua franca, but in ling English, which is accepted by mainstream impactful uh, journals or, you know, as a book series, this is a major challenge. So how do we get there? So these are questions that I think should be also addressed in a, a discussion like that. The other thing is, to what extent for those of us who have institutional links with universities, either as staff or as PhD research students, how much support do we get from our universities to publish in certain avenues, like open source journals, for instance? Do we get financial support from our institutions to allow us to do that? So for me, the question of publication and having impact is directly associated with social circumstances, where we are, who do we want to establish a dialogue with. In our particular case, I think having publications in English is very important because it's, in terms of dissemination, it circulates much more. But it's an extra challenge for Spanish and Portuguese speaking communities to achieve that. So these are pending questions that I think should be addressed. It may more than kind of only high quality uh, um, outputs. At least that's the way I see that concerning the audience that we have here. Well, uh, Thank you so much for giving me so many so many topics to talk about. <laughs> um, um, so, uh, Stephanie, you, you mentioned uh, reviewers, and I think that's that's an extremely important part of the publishing process. And you mentioned some were kind, and 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 obviously I have experience with reviewers, people who read manuscripts, and I've read many manuscripts myself. And I do take the the, the job of reviewing other people's work quite seriously. Um, and I've experienced reviewers who haven't taken it that seriously, and I've experienced, uh, experienced unkind or disinterested and, and so on. So, but I, I do think that the, the, the reviewing uh, process is a very important one and um, often, yeah, obviously there's very little visibility also for those who do uh, uh, the work um, and so on. Um, and the other thing is that um, publishing in, in, in Spanish, in Portuguese, in English, or in German. I mean, in Germany we have 
very much the same discussion. I've got colleagues who, who, who want to publish in German and, and oh, who want to publish in German and um, uh, yeah, sort of pretend that they don't belong to a wider global community because of course it becomes more difficult to access that research if you don't speak German. So I do think I'm very much in favor of publishing in one language, and it happens to be English. But 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 yes, it's 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 a hard process. And maybe the other the other topic that is might also be relevant for those who are more established and have long lists of publications is authorship. So many papers are published uh, with uh, more than one author, and some journals expect uh, authors to to say very explicitly who did which part. Uh, it, contributing uh, to that uh, to that publication um, and and obviously it's it's sometimes very difficult to to uh, say that very clearly because often if you work in a team um, ideas go back and forth tasks are shared I mean sort of yeah I mean it is it is it is very important I think and um, and I think um, uh, at least a little bit of transparency there um, who does what apart from sort of the 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 order of the authors, right? Um, which is maybe not always that transparent. I mean, different communities ascribe different values to uh, the order of authorship. But, but it, 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 in that sense, it's a bit part of that discussion. Who, uh, who benefits from that research? In what way? Uh, and who has access to it? Um, uh, sort of ties in with that, right? So, um, but yeah. But I think that's that's that's. Definitely something that is good. The first time I uh, published in a, pay, in, in a journal where, where we had to say who did what, reprised, and how on earth am I going to you know, disentangle uh, this process? But I, I, I do think it's important, especially also um, in the context of so many papers being published. I mean, um, I don't know, you, 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 you click the computer once and out tumble, I don't know, 150 papers, right? And people have to read these things. So that's maybe another thing. Thank you very much. Is it open? No, it's in, that's just to be working. Thank you very much. Now you've mentioned, I just want to touch on the issue of institutions that Fabio, that, that, that Fabio touched on. Because there are many things that come with that idea of the institutions that we work in and the expectations that we've got versus the ones in the industry. For instance, when I think of institutions, I, I think immediately of the indexing of the journals, because we are expected to publish it in certain high-impact journals only. And if you contribute to something else, it's not that appreciated, uh, particularly if it deals, say, for instance, um, besides translation studies, I also publish in uh, English language pedagogy. And uh, whenever you, you publish in that field, uh, compared to other outlooks in the university, they tend to look down on humanities, particularly this sort of thing. So, uh, probably you mentioned also the idea of the funding that we get to this, and that's very interesting because increasingly we want to publish things that are open, that are open access, but in the end, someone has to pay the bill for the open access anyway. So, to what extent are our institutions uh, uh, able or eager to support us in that? And the issue of authorship that you mentioned, uh, that you mentioned more, is also interesting because uh, in humanities it's very frowned upon when you publish with many with many authors. You are expected. So my, my department is quite eclectic. We have linguistics and literature. So you can imagine the reaction of our colleagues when we say, for instance, that we have say experimental research with say ten plus authors. So they say, oh, who did what? And then we start questioning each other. So how do you feel that we can address this issue? How, sh what should be the institution's position to allow this to have some sort of more leeway and that basically addresses the, the, the field of translation rather than meet up only with expectations of the university and the establishment? What do you think, Stefan? Well, I have thought a, uh, a lot about this. Uh, recently because um, institutional requirements for uh, index factors and number of publications per year has been increasing 
uh, the demand for, for productivity as requirements for promotion, as requirements for funding, getting funding. And on the other side, uh, you have your research interests who want to do a good study, you want to have, you have your data, your, I mean, it's like there's two sides of a coin, you know, being a researcher and being like a publishing person, a person that produces um, scientific products for uh, the academic um, world. And for the institution, and louder? the requirements. Sorry? Louder? Ah, sorry. Do you have it here? There? No? No. It was muted. It was muted. There we are. Okay, sorry. I'll repeat that. It's it's like two sides two sides of the same coin. You want you are a researcher of on one side, and on the other side you are required to have a high level of productivity in high impact factor journals to get funding. And so I'm not sure that we can do much about that in a sense that no wonder that this publish or perish thing exists. You know, it's like. The, it, it looks like there's no other way than just publishing. Um, we have had, I mean, I usually discussed with my uh, institutional authorities about how the discipline I work in is a small discipline that uh, I will never uh, perhaps publish or not very soon in, in a web well science Q1 journal because I don't know if there's one or there isn't in, in my discipline. And, and I have to make them understand that I don't need to do that for to be relevant, to produce impact um, um, research, to make um, a scientific contribution to the field. So I think that's a discussion that the academic world needs to have. Um, and uh, each each one of us with our institutions, perhaps not by ourselves, but as a as a as a community. But I find difficult, as I said, because we have this uh, dichotomy, or like there's no other way that to either publish or uh, stop getting all the the professional things that you do as an academic in an, in an academic institution. Uh, yeah, let me uh, think. This is very much what's always in the back of my mind. And I'm not addressing uh, colleagues here who have an outstanding uh, publication record because these are people who know how to get there and they, 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 they've been through many different hurdles. But I, I think I'm much more concerned with the younger audience here who, hearing from us on this side uh, of the room, we say, okay, so we would need some advice or we would need some guidance as to how to get there because we want to find jobs, we want to have a career, and uh, what we do to get there. So I, I think, uh, well, Stephanie said something here very important, which is doing what you like first. So I think that's perhaps what I think is more important. And this is my case, you know. Uh, I, I, I was fortunate enough to find a topic, a research topic, which I liked. And because I had the topic, things became much easier, perhaps. Because I had the eagerness, I had the motivation, and so I made an extra effort because I liked it. It's not very easy to do that when you don't really like the topic you are researching. So I think number one is just find a niche, not only that you feel comfortable in, but that you really like, you're eager to pursue. So addressing the younger colleagues here. And then, so there are many elements involved, and the institutional element is very, very important. For some of us, and that varies from country to country, institution, from institution, but even for a PhD grant, you have to have a regular output so that your PhD grant is renewed. And if you don't, so that that constant state of panic, which has a direct impact on mental health, 
So I, I'm addressing other issues here, but I think they are very important when we consider publications as kind of a driving force for us in academia. So to what extent that should be a goal that affects our mental health? And I think our institutions should be aware of that. And I'm also talking about it from an institutional perspective. I think it's very important for those who have a leading role in academic administration to look at human beings, be them lecturers, professors, or students. Because at the end of the day, so if we just go over a certain point, so we won't be able to publish good stuff anyway. But supposing that the conditions are ideal, and then we are all in the perfect scenario where we like what we do, where we have the institutional backing, and we have some interesting output, where do we disseminate that? And that again, I think it's a very important question. Question number one is high impact factor journals. This is what we all hear about. But then I think there is something that Nestor said, which is also very important. Does this suit the research field I'm embedded in? Because for some uh, research tracks, the values of publication are others. So for some, it's just kind of um, high impact journals, and that's what it is. But for others, these are book series. And for others, there, there are other products, other types of output. I think we should all take that into account. So that's why I'm deviating a little bit about from what would be the mainstream topic. How do I get published in high impact journals and I move up the ladder? I think there are underlying questions that we have to take into account so that we really get there at the end of the day. So, but that's not me. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, Fabian. That was an interesting point you raised there. Sort of these, these sort of the life has become very fast anyway. Not only for us academics, but I mean, the pressure to produce in, in many to consume information and so on. I mean, um, I, I won't. Don't get me started on emails, right? <laughs> <laughs> but but um, uh, I've got a friend who who, who works in, in the biosciences, and he says typically at the end of a project. Um, uh, his colleagues would, would say, oh, we still need 15 patterns. So let's just tweak a couple of patterns and, and then we have them, 15, right? So, um, and, 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 and that's my point about too many publications. I mean, obviously, good stuff needs to get out there. And independently of the in impact factor it has, uh, it needs to get out. It needs to be read. It needs to be shared. It needs to be shared in a transparent way. But, but, um, the perverseness of, of the pressure and the quantification of, of impact is that it produces situations where people just churn papers and patents and stuff out, which, you know, doesn't add much new things. I mean, um, I guess it's more impactful uh, to publish something 10 years later and in the meantime nothing, uh, if that paper then really moves something, right? Um, but just having a, a constant flow of papers doesn't guarantee quality. Um, in the best of worlds, it's both. But, uh, but yeah, and actually, I don't know uh, how others in, in uh, from those who publish <laughs> how they feel about it. But um, but yeah, and I guess it's daunting if you haven't ever published. Uh, it, it must be quite daunting. Um, so yeah, I can sympathise with that. Um, Thank you very much. Now. Fabio, you mentioned something very interesting about thinking of younger audiences and some sort of advice and how to get that. And you have mentioned that, uh, um, and you have given them some sort of interesting advice of choosing something that they liked uh, as a first stage. Now, combining what you have said with what Moritz has said as well, um, and what Steph said earlier, it is interesting to see to see that uh, because. Many PhDs are required publications in order, you know, to start the academic tracks. Uh, sometimes they're not introduced to what happens with predatory journals. And I think that has played not just, you know, translation studies, but all, you know, academia. Um, and to that extent, what advice would you give people who are now receiving, say, I don't know, about 
five to ten emails a day saying publish with this, publish with that. And sometimes you just don't know. And it's not just publishing, but also when you do research, for instance, uh, some of the students that I've had the pleasure to work with, when they look up information, uh, they see that it's a journal, that there has a name there, and it says journal of blah, 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 and they immediately think, oh, this is legit, because it's a journal. But then you look up the journal, and you see that it's not very good quality, and then we, we don't know what the review, peer review process has been. So if on those lines, Steph, Moritz, Fabio, what advice would you give students so that they don't fall prey to this sort of behavior in order to, you know, deal with this sort of uh, machine of publication that it's required from us from the very early beginnings? So, Steph, what would you say? Well, uh, first of all, I think that it's relatively easy to identify a predatory journal, and there are several guidelines on the internet with how, with guidelines and um, recommendations on how to identify a predatory journal. So I don't think that is the, really the problem. I think the problem is um, that you actually feel the pressure to solve a problem of number of publications to for funding, for scholarship, and to fall prey of that vicious circle. <laughs> because if you are just starting your uh, your PhD program and you're already thinking that way, <laughs> you won't probably you you will probably go on like that throughout your career. You know, it, it, it will it will look like an, uh, something that works for your career. So I would, my recommendation would be to stay away from that thinking. That it's uh, to 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 realize that to make a contribution for your field, which is what I think we, is what we we ultimately want to do here, uh, you don't need and you don't have to publish in a predatory journal. So um, it takes patience. It takes probably a lot of um, self-regulation of anxiety. Of, of uh, being uh, perhaps too much um, uh, um, demanding on yourself, ex uh, exigency, I don't know the word. Excessiveness. Over demanding of your own possibilities, of your own um, productivity. So that would be my recommendation. Don't fall prey to those pressures and uh, Plan your career as the, with the ultimate goal of making a contribution to the field and being trying to be happy. <laughs> so, uh, one interesting thing about the discussion here is that we all seem to agree with each other. There's not yeah. much controversy. <laughs> yeah. We say something, and the other one says, oh, yes, and this and that. I love but, wanted us to fight. Yeah, but we <laughs> don't have any fighting, so sorry to, sorry to let it out a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. But then I would like to bring something in with respect to predatory journals or getting a culture or becoming part of a culture uh, or academic culture. It's all about the learning experience, right? So we have to learn how to get there. We have to learn how to play the game, so to speak. So I would like to give you an example, which for me was very successful, very interesting, and it also shows a lot of generosity. Uh, a couple of years ago, I had the idea of creating a series in my PhD program called Conversations with an Author. And that was always whenever we had the opportunity of having a visiting colleague, a colleague visiting for one, two weeks, sometimes longer. And then we created this kind of workshop. And that's why I said it was an act of generosity, because it required from that particular colleague uh, to be open and honest about his or her own publication track. And the idea was to offer students, PhD students, a paper which had been published in a high-ranking journal. The, the students would read that paper, have time to think about it, but then in the conversations with the author, which was well known, you know, so figure in our research community, so they would be exposed to the peer review process. So 
that's what I meant generosity in a sense, because they would see the first draft, you know, the draft which was first submitted, the, 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 the feedback they got from reviewers, and then how um, the author reacted to that. So it was an ongoing conversation, but from the moment I start writing my research, as someone who has a lot of experience, and then you suddenly see as a student that even a person with a lot of experience goes through peer review, gets good and bad comments, and that person is in the, has the capacity to filter out what is biased review, because we also have lots of peer reviews which are completely biased, and then you can filter out or you can respond to it in a certain way, or take on board critical comments which are very constructive. And then at the end of the day, you see that that paper, which you have read first at the final product, undergoes a series of phases, and that becomes part of the learning experience, because you are having a conversation with an author who doesn't only discuss the final product with you, but the ongoing production of that product. You know, so how it evolved. I think that is one example, but we can have many others. Uh, that how we make young scholars familiar with the culture of the publication. Not just, it's not just the product out there that you read and quote. It's just how you get there through different steps. And there's never just a one time thing, right? So I think it's, again, it's again about learning how to do it, acquiring or developing a culture, uh, which in that particular case would lead to a research outcome. I, I think, if I may, uh, uh, something that ties in with that is is um, I'm very particular uh, about quoting, right? So, uh, with my students, if I get essays, I'm, I'm I'm very harsh if they don't quote properly, and and it, it, they think it's fastidious. He's being, you know, he's he, yeah. But but um, but also, I encourage students to look at published um, material and really trace back where does this exactly come from? I mean. I hope you always do that anyway. But uh, um, but um, and sort of and then you see how how much uh, how little often uh, people relay on other people's work and 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 that's I think maybe the central part of of sort of publishing or for, you know that's that's the border where you say this is new this is mine this is ours this is what we produce and that is what already exists and that is that is it's becoming increasingly difficult of course. To go through all that literature, right? I mean, it's getting more and more and more specialized and more specialized and so on. But, but how people cite, the way they cite, how exact they are when they cite, how honest they are when they cite, um, that is, 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 a, is a long and, and, and very helpful process for students, in my experience. And they see, oh, okay, so yeah, anyway. Um, and, and also in, in students' essays, to be because once they're you know gone, once they're out there publishing, <laughs> that's it. Yeah, and they're on. Thank you very much. Um, you know, as I was listening to you to your answers and uh, the advice that you gave to students, particularly at the very end when you touched on referencing and you know the, the importance of reference uh, of referencing properly, I was thinking I'm discussing with some other members of the audience the other day. Uh, well what's been on the news lately, the idea of artificial intelligence and the impact that it has now that you have software that you can basically ask the software to produce and the extent to which you can produce accurate uh, academic papers. So uh, we have seen some ideas as to how that could, for, for instance, impact research in many ways. But how do you, how do you, how do you see the future of publishing in translation stu uh, studies with the idea of also being, you know, integrated with uh, artificial intelligence. And I, and I mentioned this because at times we see that uh, in this rush that we have discussed, in this idea that we have to publish or perish, people turn to desperate things, one of them being, of course, predatory journalism, but also, uh, but also they will turn to any, any support that can actually allow them to finish a piece of work in a very short piece of time in order to have it published as soon as possible. So in that regard, how do you see the, that particular challenge or opportunity as well in the future in, in publishing in our, in our field? What would you say is that? I'm of the idea that um, technology and artificial intelligence being one 
type of technology, we have to make it work uh, for us. Uh, we have to work with it and make it work for our benefit. That's why it's there. I am student, or uh, at least that's my plan. Um, but of course, that uh, seeing what artificial intelligence uh, is doing now or is capable of doing now, I think that um, more and more um, me measures will be taken to make sure of uh, good quality publications do not have um, any traces of plagiarism or any traces of or good uh, authorship. And so to make sure that uh, there is no use of this artificial intelligence in a, in a way that is not honest or ethical. So journals are implementing tests for against uh, or using tests for plagiarism, for the use of artificial intelligence. And uh, we should be aware of that, that, it, um, that those measures are being taken. You know, uh, again, a predatory journal will not care if you wrote the paper or a chat GPT. They just want something to put out for them, for their business. But a good quality journal will do, um, follow ethical guidelines to make sure of authorship, to make sure of, uh, um, no plagiarism on, on, on the manuscripts. So I think that's what a good quality journal, and if we want to publish in good quality journals, we have to be aware of that. Uh, I was hoping to be able to disagree, but at the end, <laughs> this is very difficult. Yes, yes. So, uh, look at that whole process. Yes, yes. No, but no, I think just touching briefly upon predatory journals again. I think uh, that all depends on the research tradition you come from. Because uh, I believe that in our small research community, so that was not something that we should be worried about. Because, I mean, we know that where we want to get. So, we, so I think we are fortunate enough to know, okay, so this is bad and we are not going to go that way. Whereas for technology, I think this is different because then we really have to embrace it. But the point is, how do we embrace it? So the question is, uh, ChatGPT can be a friend or a foe. And it's up to us to decide whether we want one or the other. right? So it's very important that our institutions are aware of it in a much global scale, so that things or measures are taken not only to prevent that, from happening, but to protect us from happening. Because it works both ways. It's not just like using it. We get it too, right? So I think it's still in its infancy for us to say, you go this way and you go that way. But there is a lot of exploration to go on. It's a learning process. And uh, I'm very curious, personally speaking, as to where this will lead. In uh, uh, translation studies and cognitive translation studies, if you love, or cognitive translation and interpreting studies. So this is a question I asked the title of Pablo at the end of her lecture. So how do we take it on board? And that's a question that we don't have an answer for because this is very new. But it's out there and it's a challenge. And I would say rather than rejecting it, I think we should embrace it meaningfully. But I don't know. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I hope I have a question for you, which will generate at least debate. Uh, <laughs> okay. I assume you all have uh, people who clean your offices. You do. Yeah. You do that yourself? In my office, I do. Okay. Okay, but uh, the whole department. Yeah, but there are there 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 yeah, people. Who so, do. so, so, would it be possible to work with those people? I mean, sort of, um, and there's. A whole range of people who are involved in the work we do, and sort of the authors, a handful, maybe ten, maybe fifteen, sometimes, but a whole lot of people are involved in that process, right? So should they get, you know, attribution? Should they not? Um, the same question is, um, you know, Andy Warhol, right? Yeah. <laughs> Andy Warhol, uh, not himself, but his his legacy the foundation is in court right now, right? Because 
He produced a picture on the basis of a photograph taken by the photographer, um, and she has now uh, 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 brought him to court. Foundation. Um, and in a certain sense, the knowledge that is encoded in these models that we use uh, uh, um, to produce language, image, and so on, um, depends on the data that we have produced. I mean, we've sold translation memories and have, in the best case, gotten some money for that, right? So, um, so yeah, so in a certain sense, um, the question is, is, is really for humanity, how we negotiate the ownership of this knowledge, especially because, uh, I mean, that people are talking, the gold rush, the data gold rush, will soon be over, right? So, <laughs> Um, so, so once um, uh, there's enough data, then there's no need for new data, right? And then our data is huh? And it's, translation is, is, is maybe what we have closest, but it's not the only thing. It's a very interesting question, Maurice, because it also brings about the idea of authorship that you mentioned, but not of the paper, but who owns the data? Because if you have money from an institution, then who has the rights to the data? Well, it's, it's there, and to what extent can you use it in, in, your, in, your, own, uh, in your own studies? Um, I heard this, you know, this old, very, this old piece of advice that, uh, about authorship, and they used to say, like, if I write it, it's mine, if you write it, it's yours, and if we both write it, it's ours. But now, and seeing, for instance, after this conference, the data sets and how you work in order to get the experiments running, the design and the, getting the participants and all the different stages of the process, it's much more difficult to come to that sort of clear cut differentiation and how to attribute, you know, authorship in that regard. And maybe you who are more experienced could, could, could discuss on that a, a, little, bit, a little bit more. Uh, I pass on the question to the rest of the panel. Seth, have you? Thank you. Yeah. I, I think it's kind of an interesting question because, again, it's determined by the type of culture, academic culture, you're embedded in. Um, in literary circles, authorship, and single authorship, is kind of a prerequisite because what we are actually doing is just expressing yourself as an author with respect to another author or another group of authors. So working collectively becomes methodologically very difficult. So it's a culture which will lead to certain publications in a certain way with a type of discourse. Right? Whereas for us, who are the humanities, in the social sciences, in languages, but also in empirical work, so doing empirical research, we, we, we share different cultures. So in different cultures of publication. And one of the things is we work collectively, but we don't have the same sort of authorship sequence that they would have in physics or in chemistry, where there is a fixed order of who comes first and who comes second. There is a, there is a hierarchy of, of, of authors, and you know exactly where you are according to how you're positioned in that series of authors. We don't share that same culture, right? So we, we have values which are still under construction, and for some of our departments, if we publish a paper with 10 other colleagues, the question that would come to you from the head of department or some uh, administrator would be, but, you know, so, where is your body there? So how can I assess that? So again, so where are we? I remember a, a, a colleague of mine who I have worked closely with for many, many years. So she comes from a literary background, but went into translation studies, became involved in cognitive translation studies, and up to a point where she came up to me and said, Fabio, I will have to do something very difficult to continue on this research trend, I'll have to give up single authorship, which for her academic background was something very, very difficult to do. So I think these are things that we have to take into consideration. How comfortable we feel with respect to sharing not only our names, but our data with others. 
So uh, how interesting is it that someone draws on my data to do something else? So these are all open questions for us in our small uh, research world, right? And they have to be established in, uh, in terms of a common ground, because we don't simply borrow from others. And this is a statement that has been going on in our field for a number of years. Uh, since Sharon O'Brien published that very interesting paper, The Borrowers, and to what extent we borrow, to what extent we lend. And this is something that is also part of the publication world, right? I have a question that I like on, on those lines, Fabio. Um, about, because you mentioned different cultures, this, I think this will be like the last bit before we go have lunch, because everyone's got faces that oh, I want to have lunch. Uh, so I promise this will be the last bit. Um, because you were talking about coming from different cultures, academic cultures, that is. And here comes the thing of interdisciplinarity. Um, because sometimes uh, we have the issue that we want to publish something that crosses boundaries between one discipline and the other. And the problem is that you attempt to publish in some sort of journals that say, oh, this is too, say, for instance, too psychological for translation studies. So uh, it's, it, it can't go here. So you better try translation studies. You go to translation study journals and tell you, oh, no, this is way too psychological. It doesn't belong here. So the problem with that, is trying to publish something that comes from different disciplines, uh, comes with finding, as you mentioned, the right output that accepts the conventions and you try to navigate those 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 difficult and turbulent waters. So what advice could potentially you as more experienced um, researchers give to those trying to aim to those sort of journals uh, with interdisciplinary uh, research? Steph, would you, do you have a couple of, of um, I would say that the team is actually interdisciplinary because sometimes we believe that we are being interdisciplinary and not necessarily so. Uh, in that case, um, it's when you have a, a, a team from with people from different disciplines and then you are using perhaps also complementary methods, uh, there are journals that are more open to receiving those kind of uh, studies than, than others that I think in our field are very specific. Um, and we have understood, and we have certain types of interdisciplinarity here in our field that is, uh, that is not necessarily the same type of interdisciplinarity that there is in other fields. For instance, in this uh, field of uh, cognitive translation studies, our interdisciplinarity is with psychologists, with uh, neuroscientists, and that is that's pretty much it, you know. Uh, it's not with a wider range of disciplines. So, um, I don't know. Um, I would say that um, focus on journals that will be open enough to also be interested in, in translation from that uh, interdisciplinary view and um, I have a good interdisciplinary study, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, I think that, again, it's part of the niche that you're in, the academic culture that you share with colleagues, because then you would be directed to publication values or avenues that are more suitable to what you do. So I think one of the things that really help, I mean, particularly young researchers who are trying to find their place in our those research community, is to learn from others. So, and this is when I mentioned generosity uh, as a quality that I really, academic generosity, where a quality I really appreciate, it's just that not only telling about the success story, but telling about the whole path. So I went this way and it didn't work out. So then I tried that way and then it worked out. So, and of course, the journals change from time to time as editors change. It's not just because the journal has the same name that is the same journal. I mean, editors and editors in chief 
are key figures in determining what the journal is like and what is accepted. So there is a first filter out process which is carried out by those people alone before they go into peer review. So understanding that and talking to people who have had that experience and sharing honestly among, this is what strengthens a research community. It's this kind of openness and generosity that you don't tell only success stories, you tell the whole process. And the more we can do it, I think the better output we're going to get there and the stronger we're going to get because then we'll be more focused, more direct. So at least this is the way I see. Yeah, and, and and I think I think interdisciplinarity is 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 a curse and and a blessing uh, at the same time, right? So I mean, I, I talk to colleagues colleagues in physics and and, and and biology and so on, and and they have exactly the same problems we have. I mean, different colors, different names, and so on, but it's just the nature of human knowledge and and the advancement advance, advancement of our uh, of the sciences in general that that um, becoming more and more specialized. So, so uh, maybe my advice uh, for per, both uh, getting your first publication out and also for uh, for navigating this this interdisciplinary world is, um, I guess, ties in what you called enjoying something or liking something. I would even go further and calling it an obsession. A passion. Yeah. You can also call it being very angry and really wanting to get something done. Uh, done is a motivation. Really being frustrated with the situation in this field, in the subfield, they're not doing this, right? So um, I don't know. Um, strong feelings, emotions <laughs> carry you a long way, <laughs> um, and um, and make the long hours and the short nights worthwhile. Mm -hmm. <laughs> very poetic. Quite poetic. Well, thank you very much for joining us.